Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, friends and visitors of St. Martin Lutheran Church. Uh, this is Pastor Jim. Today is Thursday, April 23rd. Uh, wishing you a good morning for our daily devotion today. Um, we are going to be continuing to collect any care package items people would like to drop off at the church. We're going to continue until next, this coming Tuesday, April 28th. So, it, you know, a bag of candy, any, any items you think someone might want in a care package, we have a red bin outside uh, Lori's office at the church. You can just drop it in the bin. Um, if you have anything else that's paper, that can go right in the mailbox as well. Um, and next week on Thursday, we have a team. We're going to be assembling the care packages and then delivering them off to Wellspring Lutheran. And, and I'm happy to be working with Pastor Sean Fenske and uh, – uh, some of the members from St. Lawrence Church and Frankenmuth, especially from their Stephen ministers, who are going to be assisting and contributing in this effort um, as well as we kind of do our small part in the community to thank uh, the, the many, many people who continue to work uh, during this difficult time for all of us. Um, a reading for today, a reading for today is from the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter, and we begin at the 13th verse. And this is the, this is the Emmaus walk, or the, the, the story of the two disciples leaving Jerusalem on the afternoon of that first Easter. And uh, they're not real happy about the things that had transpired that day. So this is what we read, Luke 24, beginning at verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking about each other, about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discuss, discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you were holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. How he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. You know, this is, this is quite a compelling narrative in, in the gospel story. And, and Luke, Luke seems fit to, to include in detail towards the end of his gospel in the 24th chapter. And the story of two disciples walking down a dusty road to the village of Emmaus. Most biblical scholars believe it was about seven and a half miles, 60, 60 stadia, 
seven and a half miles northwest of Jerusalem. And it's uh, 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 nearing dark on that very first Easter day as they're leaving Jerusalem. And of course, their talk centers on what had happened on the crucified Jesus. They said it's just been three days since he's been crucified. And you can almost feel the despair and the pain in their voice. As they say, I can hardly believe it. I can hardly believe what happened. For them, life seemed hopeless. And, and just in that moment, in their hopelessness, a, a stranger joins them. Of course, we know it's the resurrected Jesus. They don't. In fact, God's word indicates that they were kept from recognizing him for some reason. It's part of the mysterious nature of God. Why they were kept, we don't know. And, and, and sort of Jesus, uh, uh, stumbling upon these two disciples, then says to them, you know, tell me what's going on. What, what's been happening? And they stop and they turn to him and, and they, in, in kind of in incredulity, they turn to the resurrected Jesus and said, what have you been doing for the past few days? Uh, where have you been? Uh, how is it that you haven't heard about this Jesus of Nazareth? And, and these two disciples tell this stranger, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and the people. The chief priests and the scribes handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. And we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And then they add in what is more, three days later, some women of our own group reported back that his tomb was empty and that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. You know, the, this story has always fascinated me. Um, this scene between these two beloved disciples, one named Cleopas and one unnamed, uh, filled with sadness and despair over the death of their friend, telling this stranger, a stranger how when the nails were driven into his hands and to his feet, that their hope for the future had been taken away from them. These words of grief and sadness and no doubt that Jesus himself was touched by their pain. And, and I think when we listen to what the disciples on the way from Jerusalem to Emmaus are saying, I think there's a message for us today. And listen to what they say. They say, this Jesus of Nazareth, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God. And the chief priests handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. And they said, we had hoped. We had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They're almost saying we, we used to hope, but we don't hope anymore. We've discarded all our hope together because that's the way they felt. He was dead and he was gone. He died a cruel death on the cross and now it was over. And, and you know, for those without a resurrection faith, for those without a resurrection faith who have not yet heard and believed the good news of Christ crucified, and resurrected again, death is a terrible thing. It is the end. It is complete. It is the very definition of complete hopelessness. It puts an end to our hopes for the future. It puts an eternal barrier between us and the ones we love, the ones who have gone before us. That without a living hope, without a living faith in the resurrected Christ, we have no hope. It was in the year 1847, and a young physician in Edinburgh, Scotland, had made an amazing discovery. He had discovered chloroform. And so in 1847, for the first time, patients could be, uh, would, have, would be able to avoid the excruciating pain of surgery um, with having chloroform make them unconscious during the surgery. And although we don't use chloroform, many... Uh, historians point to 1847 as the time when it made surgeries possible without having to be conscious during them or or passing out that anesthetics that the science of anesthetics was born in 1847 and uh one time dr alexander alexander simpson was being interviewed and uh the 
reporter asked one of those, they call them softball questions, right? It's a question meant to, to you kind of lob it out there. And the reporter asked, it was a young student and said, Dr. Simpson, what in your opinion is the greatest discovery ever made? Thinking that he was going to, of course, say, well, my discovery of, of chloroform. But instead, this is what Dr. Simpson said. In my opinion, the greatest discovery a person can ever make is to find the grace of God. Is to find the grace of God. And he meant it. Not just out of sense of humility, but from personal experience. You see, Dr. Simpson and his wife had a daughter, a young, a young child they dearly loved. One day she took ill and she passed away. And a few months later, they placed a stone at her graveside. And on the stone, they inscribed her name, Faith Simpson. And below the name, the dates of her very short life. And there was more they put on the, the gravestone. Above the place for her name, they had inscribed the words, Thank God for Faith. Faith Simpson and Faith in God. And faith in God. Uh, Reverend Jabez Thomas Sunderland, writing again in the late part of the 19th century, wrote a poem uh, that talks about this resurrection faith we have. And this is what he writes. The stars shine down upon the earth, and the stars shine upon the sea. The stars look up to a mighty God. The stars look down on me. The stars will shine for a million years, a million years and a day. But because of Christ, I live and love even when the stars pass away. Such is the hope we have because of the res resurrection of Christ. Such is the trust we have in God, a faith and a hope and a trust that those two disciples discovered when in the breaking of the bread, they recognized Christ for who he was. And in that moment, they said how our hearts were burning, not only when we were with him, but when he opened the scriptures to us and showed us that from Moses and all the prophets was leading up to this moment when God would do this new thing, this new covenant through the blood of his son. Great story. Great story. And uh, in, in reading this story, uh, our, our hymn for today uh, comes from the LSB. It's hymn 606, and it's, I lay my sins on Jesus. And it's, we lay our sins on Jesus because of the very fact that he lived and he died and was resurrected for us. So we can lay our sins on him, the perfect sacrifice. <laughs> I lay my sins on Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God. He bears them all and frees us from the accursed law. I bring my guilt to Jesus to wash my crimson stains. Clean in his blood most precious, till not a spot remains. I lay my wants on Jesus, the fullness dwells in him. He deals all my diseases, my soul he does redeem. I lay my griefs on Jesus, my burdens and my cares. He from them all releases, he all my sorrow shares. I rest my soul on Jesus, this weary soul of mine. His right hand me embraces, I on his breast recline. I love the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, Christ the Lord. Like fragrance on the breezes, his name abroad is poured. 
I lay my sins on Jesus. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. God bless your day, and I will see you all very soon.